morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to this, the second of three satellite conversations with Tariq Ramadan. Our overall theme this week is Islam-West relations, and our topic today is Muslim minorities in Western Europe. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. It's a pleasure to welcome you and welcome many of you back to this historic Gaston Hall at the heart of our campus. And now please join me in welcoming from a BBC studio in London, Tariq Ramadan. Thank you. Tariq, good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. We'll continue to work on, on that echo. Uh, Today is an opportunity to pick up on some of our conversations yesterday to continue those and break some new ground. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, just a brief introduction. Uh, Tariq Ramadan is a Swiss citizen of Egyptian descent. He's widely considered one of the most influential and creative Muslim intellectuals in Europe today. He's a senior fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and president of the European Muslim Network, a think tank based in Brussels. He has a list of activities and affiliations too long to enumerate. I'll mention one affiliation because it links back to our topic today. After the July 2005 London bombings, Tony Blair named Tariq Ramadan to a national commission to combat extremism. In numerous books, articles, and lectures, Tariq Ramadan has advocated a self-confident Islam that engages Western institutions and values, engages, critiques, but does not reject. He casts Muslims not as a passive minority, but as active participants in civil society and political life in Europe and around the world. He's published many uh, interesting and important books. I'll just mention two, Western Muslims and the Future of Islam with Oxford University Press 2004, and his just recently published In the Footsteps of the Prophet, Lessons from the Life of Muhammad, also with Oxford University Press. In my introduction yesterday, I touched briefly on the question, why can't Tariq Ramadan be with us physically today? As many of you know, the State Department revoked his visa to assume a professorship at the University of Notre Dame back in 2004. Three years later, we have ongoing legal battles, accusations and counter accusations, but we really still do not have a clear and convincing rationale for the U.S. decision. I don't want to dwell on this here. I will point you to a resource page we've set up on the Berkeley Center website, which tries to illuminate the controversy from many different perspectives. The point behind these events this week is to really move beyond the visa controversy to engage Tariq Ramadan's ideas. If we're serious about West Islamic dialogue, and that priority but that dialogue is a priority here at Georgetown and at the Berkeley Center. If we're serious about West Islamic dialogue, we have to listen to and engage the world's most important Muslim intellectuals. Tariq Ramadan is one. We can question him, we can criticize him, we can contradict him. We'll have a chance to do all of those today. But before we do, we should listen. So Tariq, today we look forward to listening to your reflections on Muslim minorities in Western Europe. There's much interest in the topic here in Washington, D.C. and around the United States. Our format will be the same as yesterday. Uh, you'll give a presentation of about 45 minutes, uh, go to a maximum of 25 past the hour. That will give us 30 minutes or more of time for Q&A from the audience. We have index cards that have been passed around that will give you an opportunity to pose questions uh, we've also had some people post questions online. So again, Tarek, thank you for joining us. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you again for this invitation. And as I said yesterday, I really want to thank you, to thank Georgetown, the Georgetown University and all the other organizations in the States that are supporting my case uh, and saying that it's not acceptable for me today, for example, to speak from London 
while uh, there is nothing in my record and I'm unable to, to, to enter the United States of America for reasons that are not real reasons in fact because just to be accused to have uh, given some money to an organization one year before this organization was to be blacklisted in the States is just uh, uh, not following any kind of logic. But I don't want to come to this discussion. As you said, I think that the most important thing here is to engage uh, uh, in a debate, in a conversation around essential uh, topics. But thank you for this support. I will not forget that. And it helps me and so many other Muslims not to confuse between the American people within academia, the average citizens, and the current administration. And thank you also uh, for having invited my assistant Mona Ali, who is with you on my behalf in a way, uh, in Washington, and, and she is with me and supporting all this work, and I want to thank you for that. Let me start from the very beginning on this discussion about uh, Muslim minorities in the West. Um, once again, with a short introduction, uh, not so short in fact, always my introduction are part of my, my, my uh, uh, talks, but here uh, three main or four main points that I want to, to raise uh, as preliminary remarks uh, as to the debate. And then to come to the first part will be the intrinsic dynamics within the Muslim communities in the West, in the States as well as in Europe or in Australia and Canada. And uh, then uh, the second part will be uh, from within the societies, the connections, the relationships and the environment and in which way uh, problems are uh, arising and at the same time in which way we have to avoid confusion in the debate and then my conclusion on uh, the whole topic. First thing that I wanted to say uh, is really for us to understand that the Muslim presence in the West in fact is not a new presence and maybe because we have to do a selective uh, approach of our past in Europe or in the West or in the States, uh, we tend to think that uh, Islam is in fact a foreign religion arriving in our countries just after the Second World War. This is the new presence and we have to remember, for example, for me living in the West, living in Europe, that for example the Muslim presence in Eastern Europe, it's a very old presence and if you go to uh, Bosnia, for example, and you ask the Mufti of Sarajevo, my friend Mustafa Cherich, is, this, is there something which is a Western Islam or European Islam? He could just laugh at this question because he has been there for so long and his fathers and grandfathers and generations of Muslims uh, dating back to the uh, ninth century. So I really think that sometimes in the West, we in Europe tend to think that the West is Western Europe and in America is maybe simply the people who are more visible today and we forget that there is a very old Islamic presence in, in, in Europe and also on the philosophical ground in what we come to discuss the, the building of the uh, European conscience or the Western conscience, uh, what came from Europe to the States or to Canada or to Australia or in Europe is something which is really important and it's not alien to the Islamic tradition when it comes to, for example, Aristotle, Plato's and all what we call the real, true Western philosophers uh, in fact were known and not only translated but commented and understood by Muslim philosophers and this presence is very old. So here there is something which is really important for us. It's uh, the reduction of our past is putting Islam outside the realm of the Western psyche which in fact historically speaking and scientifically speaking is wrong. And it's not, it's not uh, uh, a superficial statement or something that we can put aside when it comes, for example, to discuss the Pope's statement about, you know, the roots, the Greek and Christian roots of Europe, for example, because this is something which is, once again, a reduction of the past. The second point which is important is this new presence. Yes, there is a new presence in the West after the Second World War, mainly coming from economic reasons in, the, in, the, in Europe and not exactly the same, uh, the states being uh, uh, a space of immigrations for, 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 from the beginning, 
It's that you have Muslims going there and it's not the same background, not the same uh, uh, social status in the countries of origin, but in fact they arrive uh, approximately at the same time. The new presence, once again there is an old one, this new presence uh, in fact should be understood in two phases. The first phase is that you, we had people coming and they were having this idea that one day they would go back home. It was the same even for the migrants in, in, in the States. Many of the people who were leaving for political reasons or they were uh, coming to get some work in the States or in Canada and coming for economic reasons, mainly modest backgrounds, for example, in Europe, they had this idea that they, one day they will go back home. And they were organizing themselves of all the immigrants. And for this, there's nothing new for the Muslims here. Uh, which is exactly what happened with the Spanish when they came to France, to uh, uh, Switzerland, or the Polish, and the, or, or, or the, the Portuguese today, is that they come together as something which is the first uh, kind of uh, attitude that you have when you come in a new country. You, st uh, uh, you, you, you withdraw into yourself, you kind of isolate yourself. It's a natural self-segregation coming from a perception that you have to protect yourself from the new environment. It's not new. It's something which has to do with all the immigrations that we, the, the, the migrations that we, we, we know. And here, the Muslims were doing this. This was the first phase for the first generations. And then the second, third and onward generations become much more, uh, became much more uh, uh, visible in the mainstream. And here the reality is that everywhere in Europe and in the States, the new generations are, more, more, are much more visible in the mainstream. But our perceptions are behind the, 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 the reality or the historical reality. Because we see them today, we think, oh, there is a new community here. And we forget that, in fact, the first community uh, the first step, the first stage was isolation, but now they are reaching out. So everywhere in Europe, everywhere uh, uh, in the States, you have new generations and they are more visible in the mainstream, in universities, within academia, in the media, every, in culture, in sports, they are more visible. And we are building our perception that there is something which is a new uh, community, while in fact these people are getting out of their social religious, cultural uh, ghettos to, co to become real American citizens or European citizens, our perceptions are just now realizing that they are here because their parents were quite invisible, not uh, willing to engage because in their mind it was a temporary presence. And we have to understand that our perception here is a bit uh, uh, behind the realities. The third point which is also really important is that out of our uh, experiences in the West, uh, you know, I'm speaking about a silent revolution everywhere, in the States, in Canada, everywhere in the West. Uh, as to the, the, the thinking, the, the new thinking of the Muslims, the way they re-read re, re their sources, the way they understand the environment, but also within the society, as I said, because they are reaching out much more than what we thought, in fact, and that the social, intellectual and cultural integration is, in fact, working. The problems uh, lie elsewhere, and I will come to this. Uh, the point is that even if we can be optimistic as to this kind of uh, real integration, I don't, I don't like the word, but just to be simple here, just the, the real you know, uh, presence and, 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 and uh, uh, real uh, reality for the Muslims to be to, to consider themselves as Americans or, or Europeans, there is something which we cannot just dismiss, is that there are real and legitimate questions uh, uh, on the religious ground, but not only. And for example, there are three main or four main questions that we have. The first one is, uh, this one, which is, there is a growing number of Muslims. So, in fact, the first question is this one, is the new visibility, as I said, but with the visibility is what will be our future? What do you want exactly? And there is a legitimate question, because in some countries, the number of Muslims is going to triple or, or to quadruple in the coming uh, decades. And it's, it's the reality out of the presence, out of the conversion. And there is another dimension also, which is immigration, which is the second aspect. But here there is something which is really important is, 
what do you want exactly? And some are asking, do you want to remain Muslims uh, in the West or do you want to Islamize the West or what do you want exactly? And this is something which is a normal question for the welcoming societies. Yesterday they were the welcoming societies, now they are the societies of the people who are living here. And because of this new visibility, there are questions about our common future. The second, as I said, is immigration. Immigration is central because all the people who are telling us that we can just withdraw into our own, you know, uh, uh, nation and state and, and country and protect ourselves from people around are just not telling the truth or the historical truth. For example, we know this for the States and we know it for Europe. We need workers in the coming decades. We need people coming to work because not all the Americans or the Europeans are going to do the work which is necessary to survive. At the economic field, for example, the EU is telling us, and these are, uh, these are official figures, that in the coming uh, generation we need 20 million workers. They will come from Africa, they will come from Asia, and our economic needs are conflicting with our cultural resistance here. And this is something which is really important because they, uh, there is a growing presence and immigration is going to, it's continuing and it's not going to end and to stop. So we have to deal with this. So there is a legitimate fear here. What is the, the future of the Western identity? It's true uh, in, the, in, in America and not only with Muslims, by the way, all the discussions where the Latinos in, in the States is exactly going from this perspective is just because we are scared about the protection of our identity. We ask questions about this new presence, which is threatening the perceived uh, uh, homogeneity of our culture. So here there is something which is really important. The third one is, of course, terrorism, because terrorism is, is everywhere. And, uh, uh, you know, the people who are indulging in this, it's in the States, in, in Germany, in uh, Spain, in London, they were coming from the country. They were, for example, in, in here in London, they were born and raised in this country, and they just turned against their own country. So it means that they is something which is a true sense of belonging to this society because at the end of the day uh, one of the 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 the, 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 the muslim who was in, involved in in the the the, the bombings in in london the 7th of july was saying you are killing my brothers in iraq i'm going to kill you here and meaning by us versus you versus me it's us versus them it's i'm not part of your country which he, he's he was a british citizen so there is something which is really intrinsic uh, Lee uh, rooted in his perception of the, uh, his belonging and his uh, citizenship, but more than that, about violence and about what are the Islamic teachings in that field. The last point is some of the discrimination and all the discussion we have about women, for example. These are legitimate questions and we, can avo we can't avoid uh, addressing them. So having said that, let us come now uh, within the Muslim communities and try to, to, to understand what is going on and what are the processes that we can find within the Muslim communities as to this uh, uh, presence in the West. The first thing which is really important is to understand uh, uh, the, 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 the importance of some of the fundamental questions the Muslims were facing. And the first Muslim coming, this new presence just after the Second World War, uh, raised many, many questions about how could we remain uh, 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 faithful to the Islamic principles and at the same time being involved in a new environment. And this new environment has a specificity which is not to be a majority Muslim society. So here we had something which was the first question, and the first question is really important. And up to now, it's not going to end because we have this uh, immigration going on. Uh, it's the, the, the differentiation, the distinction between what is religious and what is cultural. Uh, the first Muslims, the first generation, uh, were coming with the idea of the right way to be a Muslim in America or the right way to be a Muslim in Europe is to remain a Moroccan Muslim, an Egyptian Muslim, a Syrian Muslim, a Pakistani Muslim. And in fact it was bringing with us the cultures of origin because this was the only way 
in the psyche, in the understanding for the people who are, have, for example, a modest background, or for, uh, even for the more uh, uh, educated people, it was just the natural way to think about being a Muslim. Our uh, presence and with the second generation and the gap between the generations, don't forget this because it's really important. There is a gap here which is very difficult. The fathers and the mothers coming with a perception, uh, 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 roots in another culture, coming in America or coming in Europe and having this perception, the right way to be a Muslim is to be Muslim as we were there. And new generations trying to remain Muslims, but at the same time just acknowledging, feeling that they are part of this society. For myself, for example, for 25 years, I was just dreaming to go back home, and back home meant, in my mind, to go back to Egypt. And then you have to realize that when you go back to Egypt, you feel that there is a gap between your own culture and the, cu the Egyptian culture. Yes, I may be Egyptian by memory, but still it's not really deeply my culture. I'm a European by culture, and so many second, third, onward generations were just feeling this, that their culture was no longer the same as their parents. So, how to remain faithful to the Islamic principles and at the same time to build something which is a new relationship with the new culture, surrounding culture, American culture, European cultures, because we, only not, we don't only have one, by the way, even in America you don't only have one. The culture in East, the East Coast is not exactly the same as the, the Western Coast and, and quite different from uh, uh, the middle of the country because this is the reality. So we, we have to deal with cultures and there is something which is really important. So to extract the Islamic principles from uh, the text without confusing them with the culture was a first process and helping the Muslims to say for example today that there is no contradiction uh, between uh, being a, Muslims by, uh, a Muslim by principles and at the same time integrating the surrounding culture because not everything in the countries of origin or the cultures of origin is good. You have to be critical, for example, not everything in the Egyptian, Syrian, Pakistani culture is good according to your principles. But on the other side, not everything in the American, Western, European cultures uh, uh, is bad as to your principles and maybe sometimes you will find that in our European or American cultures many things are closer to the Islamic principles than in the countries of origin but it needs uh, uh, to be studied, it needs to be understood and here uh, there is something which is really important in, uh, in that field is to take from the surrounding culture and to be able to say this if you look at the mainstream discourse today in America or in Canada, in Australia, in Europe, you will find that the majority of the Muslim organizations, the mainstream discourse is no problem. We are both at the same time. There is no problem and we are not rejecting our memory. And this is why I'm always saying this phrase, which is just building something which is part of confidence, self-confidence. I'm Muslim by religion, I'm Swiss by nationality, I am European by culture, I am Egyptian by memory, I'm a universalist by principle, and Moroccan and even Mauritian by adoption. I have multiple identities and uh, uh, something which are my principles that are helping me to remain who I want to be. And then at the same time, it will be exactly the same for the Americans, uh, feeling that they are American by culture and Muslim by religion with no problem. But this was the first question and a very deep question. It meant the second level, and this is what I tackled right now, is the question of identity is not to, to have a perception that we have a closed identity. We have multiple identities and moving identity, meaning by that that even for myself during my life, I'm moving from one identity to another, building a, a, a multiple dimension uh, uh, in my identity with the same principles. And this is something which is really important. And by the way, it's not only important for the Muslims, it's important for all our fellow citizens, not to, because of, uh, we are scared of who is not us, who is not like us. You know, when you don't know who you are, you are scared of who you are not. So you are building something which is an identity by contradiction or through a contradictive pro process. I think it's really important to understand that confidence is something which is important and to build this uh, multifold uh, uh, understanding of our identity is important. For the Muslims, it was important. Meaning by that, that the third concept here, which is really important, is belonging and loyalty. 
And here, when it comes to uh, leaving the country, once again, not all the Muslims, by the way, agree on this, because as I said yesterday, we have currents and trends, and some are saying we are here and we have to isolate ourselves, we are not committed to the society, we just have to protect ourselves from what is around us, because it's threatening our uh, uh, very uh, Islamic Muslim identity. Uh, but this is not the mainstream, these are the literalists or these are also uh, the traditionalists. We may respect them. By the way, I really think that we have to be very, very uh, uh, cautious in the way we portray or, 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 or deal with you know, these discourses. I will challenge their understanding of Islam, but I will not dismiss their point. I can understand, for example, that for a while someone, a young Muslim, could think that to withdraw into himself or herself, to build his or her personality, could be part of a, pra a, 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 a traje trajectory, that part of, of an ex human experience. We can just understand that when you are a teenager, you can go through this. It's sometimes a question of time. You know, you are not building your identity uh, uh, once and for all. It's a moving process. Sometimes it's out of reaction, sometimes it's out of confidence, and we have to look at this. We need some psychology here. And then when it comes to deal with literalists or, or, or conservative in that field and who are saying, no, I don't want to, to mix, I don't want to be involved in the society, my identity is against who you are, we have to deal, to challenge, to just not to ban these from the discourse, just not to put them in the extremist box, because in fact you can be a conservative, a literalist or a traditionalist without being an extremist. So we have to challenge these ideas and also to help the people to move, it's, uh, to move and, and to, to understand better their environment. But there's the, 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 the belonging is something which is really important, the loyalty. And to say, for example, when you live in a country, this is the mainstream Islamic discourse today, when you live in a country, you respect the constitution, you respect the legal uh, uh, framework, and you abide by the law. Because these laws are, you are uh, abide by them because you accepted explicitly or implicitly, there is a contract between you and your society that these laws are the common legal framework within which you have to act and to behave. And this is what we are saying. So the, 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 this legalist uh, uh, approach uh, from the Muslims as to the, the, the legal framework is everywhere. And in fact, uh, millions of Muslims, of Western Muslims are today, and I'm not saying Muslims in the West, I'm saying Musl Western Muslims, meaning Western by culture and Muslims by religion, and they are Westerners, they are uh, in their civilization, in their area of reference, a uh, universe of reference. And here, uh, uh, millions are just abiding by the law and they, they, there is no problem for millions. We are obsessed by few who are destroying and not seeing the many and the, the, the great, great, great majority who is just uh, involved. So there is something which is here a, a very important uh, uh, reality, which is the sense of belonging. And you know, we had some uh, uh, discussion about, yes, but when there is a conflict, and for 15 years I have been trying to study what are these, you know, uh, uh, points of conflict? And at the end, once again, I said that yesterday, but when it comes to understand the flexibility of the Islamic uh, uh, legal tradition and the latitude of our constitutions, you can just find a, a, a way to uh, agree or to find a way to help the Muslims to remain who they are and at the same time to respect the legal framework within which they live. So there is no real conflict here and even in the military uh, discussion, could we be involved in, in, in an army? We had uh, the answer now. Yes, we had some scholars saying no. We had the, uh, these kind of scholars, mainly from Saudi Arabia. They were telling the Muslims you can't, for example, when it came to the discussion around Afghanistan or Iraq, to, go in, to be involved in the American army, and others saying yes to show to, the, uh, uh, to your fellow citizens or to your government that you are very, really loyal to the country. We had these kind of positions, but the third position, which is a question of ethics and, and, and principle. You belong to your principle and to your country. And sometimes when you have to be involved in something which is done by your country, the real critical 
uh, 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 the real loyalty to your society is to be a, a, a critical loyalty, is to be able to say, yes, I'm an American, but I think that this is wrong. And this is what I said for the, 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 the American Muslims and Christians, because many Christians say no to the, 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 the war in Vietnam, saying, I don't, be, I don't want to be involved, this is not a true uh, a right war. And they were doing it not because they were Muslims or Christians or because they had principles and they had convictions and they say, look, I can't do that. It's in the name of my uh, belonging to my country, in the name of my value that I'm promoting something which is better. I think it's better for my country. So it's a question here, a discussion between a citizen his, with his conviction or her convictions, her uh, 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 understandings and trying to respect some principles and justice and not a question when it comes to go to kill uh, Muslims, you can't do it. And when it comes to kill non-Muslims, you can do it because you are Muslim. This is a very superficial way of understanding our Islamic teachings. The main thing is if it's just, do it. If you think it's unjust, be critical and try to, 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 to present your position on the ethical uh, ground and in the rational ground because as a citizen in a country you should be a critical citizen loyal uh, your loyalty is a critical loyalty this is the real meaning of democracy so here there is something which are the, the, the all the discussions that we had from within and it's moving and the people should understand that some of the questions that we are dealing with today are very complex, much more than what we were dealing with, with 25 years ago when Muslims were asked could we stay in this country because the people are drinking alcohol. Some scholars were saying no you can't because the people around you are not Muslims and now they are saying yes they are drinking alcohol but you are not obliged to drink alcohol so you are free, nothing prevents you from just practicing your religion if you want. So there is nothing in the Western constitutions preventing you from being a true Muslim if you want to be a true, a comp a fully Muslim in your practice and in your behavior. So it's up to you, it's your choice. So here there are these discussions, this evolution, and there is also something which is really important and we have to talk about this, is that by being in a new environment we are experiencing what was the experience of the first companions around the Prophet, and this is what I try also to, to, to show in my last book, coming from Mecca to Medina, the Muslims were dealing with a new culture exactly like us, and it came, it pushed them to come back to a better understanding of the Islamic principles beyond the culture, and one point is really important. One point is really important and for us it's crucial is the situation of the women in the Muslim community. Islam has no problems with women but Muslims have. Muslims have uh, uh, to reread the sources and to come to a better understanding and the European context or the Western context, the American context is helping us, pushing us to say what is really Islamic in the way we behave? Is this really Islamic or is this cultural? Because we have two problems here. We have a problem of literalism, taking one verse and say I can do that in the name of this verse, I can do whatever I want, so uh, forgetting the global message, the overall message for a literal uh, reading of one verse, not understanding that this has to be put into context, and on the other side we have a cultural reading of the sources, putting something which is completely wrong in the way we are dealing with our uh, problems. Uh, and, and for example, uh, when it comes to, to our cultures of origin, we are coming from patriarchal cultures and sometimes very macho cultures and we have to be critical towards our culture. There is no culture that we can take for, 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 for what it is without being critical. It's something which is really important. The dignity of the human being is to be able to be critical with his or her culture, be it American, European, African, Egyptian, Syrian. This is what is defining your mind, your autonomy, your, be, your, your, your capacity to be critical. Don't accept anything coming from your culture uh, with its excesses or its deficiencies. It's something which is really important. And we have this problem. And to be able, for example, to say, look, as to the Islamic teaching, there is something which is a deficiency from the very beginning. And it's not coming from the text, it's coming from our reading of the source, that the Muslims from the very beginning were not talking about the women as women per se, as a human being. They were talking mainly as women, uh, the women as 
to their function in the society as a mother, as a daughter, as a, a, a wife, and not as a human being. And you know this definition of what is femininity, what is a human being, what is to struggle for your rights and to get your rights, because we, are, we have a very general discourse about the fact that there is equality before God, and then we don't come to the true understanding of what does it mean within our society. So, for example, very simple thing, but the starting point of our discussion, to be able to say from an Islamic viewpoint, and this is coming from my environment, pushing me to come back to a better understanding of the text, because the environment is asking me question, is this Islamic or is this cultural? And, for example, domestic violence, it's not Islamic. The Prophet never did that, never beat a woman, uh, forced marriages, it's not Islamic, honor, uh, honor crimes, it's not Islamic, from her circumcision, it's cultural, it's not Islamic. So to have this discourse is also coming from where we are. And why is it important? Because our presence in the West is pushing us to come back to a better understanding of our sources and sending back messages to the Islamic majority countries to say what you are doing and this is what I'm doing. You know, I was last year, last summer in Africa and also visiting Morocco, Morocco, Jordan, Indonesia and to be able to tell the people there, look, what you are saying about female circumcision is not Islamic. What you are saying about forced marriages is not Islamic. When you are talking about polygamy with no conditions and not, uh, for example, saying to the first woman that the first wife that she can say no to this, it's really important because our experience in the West is now nurturing a better understanding of the principles and spreading it around uh, as Muslims uh, and to the Islamic majority country. And this is why our voice is heard there. And for the first time in our history, our presence will have a tremendous impact, not to westernize Islam, but to come to a better understanding of the roots of the Islamic tradition and being helping the people to be critical uh, uh, towards the cultures and the way the cultural dress uh, influence the reading of the sources. This is something which is really important. So all this is helping us to come to the universality of the Islamic message and helping us also to understand something which is part of the very old Islamic legal tradition, the principle of integration, meaning by that everything which is good, from whatever it's coming, it's, re it's yours. Al-hikmatu dallatul muslim fahuwa awla biha aynama wajadaha. We say in Arabic, uh, because it's a prophetic uh, tradition saying, uh, uh, um, wisdom uh, is the last property of the Muslim and he is the first to take it wherever he finds it or she finds it. There is something which is really important. If you, th you see something in this society, in the in European society or the American society which is good is yours. And then if, as I said, permission is the principle, so you, it's, per it's permitted to take everything which is good and then if you think that this is not good, you just uh, avoid it, but everything which is good is yours. And here there is something which is really important. For example, when it comes to the five main objectives of the Islamic tradition, what we call, you know, the, 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 the way towards the, the, the ideals, the Sharia, which is the way when we speak, for example, about protecting uh, religion, protecting human dignity, protecting justice, protecting your intellect, protecting your, your goods. We find these principles much more protected in the great majority of the Western society than in the Islamic majority society. So the principles, the main principles of Islam are more protected in the Western society than in the Islamic uh, uh, world today. So we have to keep this in mind and to be able to say, come back to the, the universality of our religion and take the good from wherever, from wherever you find it. And this is our understanding. So this is the intrinsic dimension and the mainstream discourse of the Muslims today in the West is this one. But, and uh, it's something that I also want to, 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 to bring to the fore here, this uh, uh, process is not going to be achieved if in our society, in the surrounding society, there is not a better understanding of what is going on. Not only from the Muslims, but also from our fellow citizens, our politicians, our intellectuals, because the problem that we are facing today really is this confusion. We are mixing everything and this is why I'm always saying we have to deconstruct the picture without disconnecting the problems. Because the problems are connected but they are not all the same. Yes, we have religious problems. 
And these religious problems, we can just once again uh, uh, avoid to talk about that. that. First, before coming to the problems, let us set the scene to be clear on what we are talking about. First, if we are speaking about Western Muslims and we are speaking about Muslims in the West, there is something which is clear. We have to come to a better understanding of commonalities and diversity. What is common is clear. Rule of law, the legal framework, we, our membership to a society, we are part of a society as residents or as citizens. There is something which is the first level is that we have a common legal framework, we have a common past, we have a common uh, uh, future, we have a common uh, uh, society and that we have to build this together. So there is something which is rule of law first and then citizenship when we are part residents, if we are residents, but mainly what will help us to build the future together is uh, citizenship. But we also accept that within this, having, having accepted that, there is uh, a room for diversity, your cultures, your religions, everything that you have, it, it, which is not contradicting the, the rules, the common rules that we are accepting together within the latitude of the, 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 the rules, you can do whatever you want because the rules are protecting the two fundamental rights, which is freedom of worship and freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience is the individual right, freedom of worship is the collective right, and then as you have these two main rights, you are free. So, the commonality is clear and the acceptance of diversity is clear and we come to a better understanding of this and having said that, we know that we are abiding all by the common law in our country. In the States it's clear, in Europe it should be clear, uh, uh, in Canada, in Australia, there are the common laws and then we have our religious practices, our uh, cultural feelings and memories and, and, and uh, imaginary, that all this is accepted, it's not a problem. Having said that, and we accept this, where could we have problems, tensions between, for example, what is common and what is coming from our belonging to a specific culture or to a specific uh, uh, religion? Here we have to come to the problem to understand where lies the problem. But I want to say something. First, I will not speak about minorities here because there is no minority citizenship in our country. So when I am a citizen in my country, don't speak about uh, 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 minority, Muslim as a minority. I could have to speak about religious problems coming from me being a Muslim and then I have to tackle the religious problem. This is part of one of the discussion, but don't reduce me to this is what you are a Muslim citizen and all the problems you have are dealt uh, are connected to the fact that you are a Muslim. This is completely wrong. It's to reduce the problem and to reduce the picture. So here we have to understand that there is no minority citizenship and more than that, I'm not a member of a diaspora. Diaspora means that we are scattered in the world and there is a center somewhere. No, I'm at home. I am at home. This is home. And for all the people who, all, who still dream of a white indigenous America or white indigenous Canada, white indigenous reality in Europe, this is over. It's a too late uh, question to be asked. It's over. Our future is pluralistic, multicolored society with multiple memories, multiple identities and commonality. And this commonality, rule of law, identity as citizens in our society and then uh, uh, an accepted diversity. There is something that we have to come uh, to a better understanding of this. So when now it comes, I'm a citizen in the country, where lie uh, the, 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 the problems? The first could be a, a question because we, to, to avoid the religious discussions is wrong, but we have some religious discussion that we have to uh, 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 tackle to address. The first one, as I said, is violence. And we need a very strong discourse here coming from the Muslims that what is done, you know, killing innocent people, this is against our Islamic teaching. To promote uh, 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 violence uh, uh, against the people, to go to kill in America, to kill in, uh, in, uh, in London, this is not acceptable. And we have to say that it's not only non-Islamic, it's anti-Islamic. And we have to say that this uh, uh, discourse should be clear. 
We have also to distinguish between the violence of the oppressors and the violence of the oppressed. For example, when it comes to people in the world resisting oppression, we also have to come to the complex reality and not having simplistic you know, statements as to say all kind of violence uh, uh, are rejected. I would say that I am against violence, but I cannot just say that all the violences are the same and when you are resisting oppression is not the same as when you are an oppressor. But killing innocent people, killing women, killing ch children, all this, all what we have, the terrorist attacks and, and these kind of suicide bombings, this is anti-Islamic, our discourse should be clear. And this is a religious discussion that we have, as I said. As I said about women, we have to come to a better understanding of the rights, women's rights in our society and to help the process here. Uh, and all the other religious discussion that we can have, uh, these are discussion coming from the religious ground. But not all the problems that we have now are religious problems and we are confusing with which kind of other problems. We are dealing with problems that have nothing to do with religion here. When it comes, for example, uh, to unemployment, discriminations on the job market, in housing, for example, these are not religious problems. These are uh, uh, social problems and we have to deal with them with social policies, urban policies and the problem is that very often our politicians, it may be in the States or in Europe or in Australia, we saw this during the last weeks, people coming and telling us that okay they have this problem because they are Muslims or they are coming from abroad uh, so we are essentializing the problem making it cultural or religious because we don't have policies so it's a, a political game to just to, to, to target these people as Muslims where they are citizens we saw this in the French suburbs it has nothing to do with Islam they were doing exactly what the French citizens are doing when they are not happy they are demonstrating and they are saying to their society to the government, treat us as equal citizens. And by the way, what the French uh, uh, young uh, citizens were doing, and you know we were portraying them with immigrant background or with a religious, uh, an immigrant religion, it's as if in our mind Islam is still an immigrant religion. I'm sorry, Islam is a Western religion, is a European religion, is an American religion, and we have to, to, we have to keep this in mind. It's over this discussion about, is it possible for a Muslim to be a Westerner? This question is just showing how much you are far from the reality of your society. Because millions are already doing this, or practicing this, or behaving as Westerners, and at the same time being Muslims. So here... The problem is that we have to distinguish these social problems and to come to uh, uh, a better uh, social understanding, political understanding. It, it's a question also when we deal with racism and with education. In some, of our, some parts of our Western countries, we have second-class schools where the people are gathered together. It's the case in Washington, it's the case in New York, it's the case in Detroit, it's the case in, in, in around San Francisco, but it's the case in suburbs in France, it's the case in many, many countries. And this has nothing to do with religion, it has nothing to do with culture. It's our way to deal with it, which is transforming social problems in religious and cultural problems, because it's easier when you don't have policies just... Uh, pretend that you have uh, make politics. So when you uh, and build a, a politic way of discussing this, a political uh, uh, way of transforming the reality, because you don't have policy, and this is the problem we have today. So here, these are social, socio-economic realities. But we also have something which will be a very, very important in the future, and it's a, a third level, which is political dimensions, because the. The, the Western Muslims now are citizens and they are coming from Africa, they are coming from the, the Middle East and they have a perception of what is going on there and they want to influence the national policy. They, they want to be heard, for example, in America saying that the war in Iraq was a mistake. They want to be heard in Europe saying that, for example, for example, what I'm always saying, the unilateral support of America towards Israel is not helping the peace process, is just not uh, first recognizing the dignity of the Palestinians and at the same time not helping the process here. By being citizens and having these voices from within, it's clear that you will have a political game on this, that you will have people not accepting the true political integration because they are threatening the old, you know, 
uh, equilibrium that we had in the West. And we cannot just uh, neglect this or dismiss the point because here we have political problem and it's true in Iraq, it's true in Palestine. It's not really visible yet in the States. But I can tell you that in many European countries and here in UK it's very important because the presence of the new citizens, now British Muslim citizens, being vocal and asking the government in the name of democracy not to do what they are doing and not to deal with dictatorships or not to to go to kill innocent people uh, because at the end of the day the Afghani people had nothing to do with the bombing in the States and so many were killed. So the problem here is also to understand the political dimension of it. So having said that and to conclude I think that we need to understand that it's a complex reality here and we have to deconstruct all this and not everything has to do with religious problems and we have to uh, isolate the religious problems and to come to a discussion about citizenship belonging to the same society and social policies and here this has nothing to do with our uh, uh, religious belonging but with our commitment to our society and this is why the great majority of the Muslims don't have a problem with the laws they don't have a problem with uh, 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 the legal framework they have a problem uh, with the discrepancy the contradiction between the stated uh, laws and the implementation of these laws because this is the problem I don't care uh, you know saying that in America it could be better than in France or in France better than in Germany or in the UK this discussion is useless in fact we have to compare the like with the like and to have to compare what are the ideals in every single society with the practices when you are talking and telling me equal citizenship true democracy transparency no discrimination no racism in my country I want to see this on the ground I want to see this at the grassroots level I want to see people just uh, having this done uh, and, and being and, and promoting you know uh, uh, consistent uh, practices political and social practices and this is what is important to uh, compare the American ideals with the American practices or the French or the Brit British or any kind of societies and here we have problem for example as to the veil in France you have some you know discussions here very quickly the first one is for example to say as a Muslim I would say there is n it's against Islam to impose into a woman to wear the headscarf. It's against human rights to impose into her to take it off. I think that this is the, the only rational and reasonable approach. No imposition. And in fact, the legal, the French legal framework are just accepting this. But because of the new visibility of Muslim, where, where the fear was spread around, and it was in fact a law of fear which was decided in March 2004, be, uh, trying to protect the French society from this new visibility uh, in the schools and saying no veils, uh, no headscarves in, in, in the school. And I think that it's a, it's, it's a bad law. It's a bad law. Now, when I'm asked, uh, because, you know, it's uh, targeting uh, young girls between 14 and 17, I'm asked how, what sh should we do is between wearing the headscarf and going to school, go to school during this period because it's imposed onto you, but as a citizens continue the struggle, as a citizens within the democratic process, just show that this laws is discriminatory, it's a, a law of fear, it's not a law of justice because it's targeting specific people and it's against the spirit of the previous law because at the end of the day if you change the law it means that before that it was not forbidden so we needed a new law to, for, to, to make it uh, unlawful and we have you know all the discussion around the Pope's statements and it came back to for example what I said about you know the roots of Europe showing or trying to show that Islam is outside the realm of the West it's wrong Islam is part of this so we need all this discussion about you know the psychology of our discussion to show that Islam has been there for a long time it's part of the roots of Europe that the legal framework should be the one that we uh, rely on and we are not using a double standard policy when it comes to Muslim there's something also which is really important about the fact that we are asking ourselves now in Europe could Turkey be part of the, the, the European con uh, uh, continent as if because they are Muslims they can't and now we have to come and once again it's a question of consistency do they abide by the law do they abide by the human rights if yes they have the right to enter if not we will wait 
But don't speak about it as if it was a religious problem. It has nothing to do with religious problem. It has to do with rules of law. It has to do with uh, uh, rule of law. It has to do with uh, uh, principles. And here people are speaking about all this, you know, uh, Turkish to be European that are problematic, forgetting that millions of Europeans are already Muslims here. And then uh, it's not the question. The question is not for Muslims to be European, but for Europeans to understand what it is to be a European, in fact. Is it a very narrow understanding of who we are, uh, an identity which is a self-segregated identity, exclusive identity, which is, in fact, against the historical uh, uh, process. So all these discussions are here. The question is always to come to a, a, a parameter on which we agree. And it's the rule of law that we have to take uh, as an, uh, the, the framework, the, legal, the common legal framework. And sometimes we have to deal with uh, psychology. We have to deal with memories. We have to be more inclusive in the way we speak about ourselves. ourselves. My conclusion here is to say all this this deconstruction and this understanding that this, it, it is all connected without being the same discussion should uh, 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 lead us to promote more clarity in the ground and not to, be, to follow in the footsteps of uh, the media pressure and some, some groups on both sides who are happy with polarization. The, the, you know, the populist uh, trends today, yesterday they were the far-right parties, now it's everywhere and we have people, they, they can make politics out of, out of this polarization. On the other side you have Muslims very happy to say, look, they don't like us, they are against Islam. So we are in between two, uh, you know, trends that are polarizing the debate and uh, uh, not helping us to build bridges. So this is why I'm controversial. I'm controversial and a danger for these people because these people, they don't want us to build bridges. And I am build, uh, 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 bridge builders. This is, what, this is what I want. I want us to come to the common ground and to stop talking about us versus them. And this is why, as a Swiss citizen, as a European citizen, as a Westerner, I think that we need to create a new we. And the we here is not me as a Muslim, you as a Christian, you as a Jew, or you as something else, but us as citizens from the same country to build something together because we, we, we share common values and common future. We have to build the common future in the name of our common values and we are much more in common than things that are uh, uh, dividing us. But let us come to the true discussion. Let us come to the true discussion. And here, there is only one way. I don't think that the global discussion will be enough. We need local initiatives and this is why I'm advocating L uh, national movements of local initiatives with people, citizens from different backgrounds, different religions, different coming together, understanding the responsibilities towards the society and the rights at the same time, and knowing what is religious and what is uh, has to do with social policies, what it has to do with urban policies, educative policies, and not to confuse everything and to come to this and to to build this new we, which is really important. The local level is really important to understand the complexity of the the phenomenon and to understand that at the end of the day the only way for us to build something is to work at the highest level of common integration a mutual integration to integrate you in my mind and to integrate and for you to integrate me in your mind is the sense of belonging which is the highest level the highest level is psychological integration it's not only the legal integration it's not only the the social integration it's just to feel that i am at home these are the principles uh, helping us to build uh, the fundamentals of my identity. But now I need to, to dress this within a specific environment. So it's conceptual, but it's really important for any Muslim, uh, yes, I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast, I'm going to respect the principles. But I, I live in a specific area, and any one of us, when we go in Africa, in Western Africa, in Senegal, in Mali, you can see that they have the same principles, but a specific way of life. In, Af uh, in North Africa, it's exactly the same, and we have exactly the same in Europe and in the States. The problem is that we are so, uh, uh, we have a so, uh, we are, uh, there is a, a lack of self-confidence, in fact. So we think, oh, because it's not really good to be an American by culture because we feel that this is not really Islamic because our perception is the only true way of being a Muslim is having the cultural dress of the countries of origin. This is wrong, once again. No, it's not my Muslim identity is not based on everything. It's helping us 
to have a direction, to have a sense, to have a, a, a meaning, to give a meaning of my life, and then I'm building this with everything else. At the end of the day, yes, if I'm asked about the meaning of my life, I will refer to the Islamic teachings, of course, because it's, it gives uh, meaning to my life and to, 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 to my death. It's the philosophical answer for the philosophers and the religious answer for the believers. Yes, but during my life, I cannot just rely on this to build my daily life. I also have to be connected with people, to be connected to a culture, and multiple identity is something which is, it depends on the ground. Uh, uh, on the discussion, just to end with this, because it's a very important question. When it comes, for example, to a philosophical question, yes, the, 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 the primacy will come to my religion. But when it comes, for example, to the next election in France, for example, and I'm uh, going to ask uh, someone, who are you going to vote to? What is your involvement in this society as citizen? His identity at that time in this field, in this question, is to be a French trying to find the right president. Not to say, I'm a Muslim, I have the good answer. You don't have the good answer because you are Muslim. Your identity here, is not, your religious identity is not helping you to take the right civic decision as a citizen. So here there is something which is really important. If you are asking me on the ground of politics, I will be a French respecting my principles, but my nationality here is first because I have to decide as a citizen with my principles, of course. So I don't think that we can just put a hierarchy like this without understanding the complexity of the context. Thank you. We have a, a series of questions uh, more specific uh, and geared to issues of integration, levels of integration uh, among Muslims in Europe. Uh, so let's try to move through them quickly. One has to do with the Mohammed cartoon controversy. The question is, why did the cartoons published in Denmark spark such a negative reaction among Muslims in Europe? Does that community have a problem with the idea of freedom of the press? No, I, I think that we have to put things into context again. During three months, I was there, I was in Denmark when it started, the Muslims were not reacting. And in fact, it was a political game from some ambassadors, from leaders, from the Muslim community, uh, bringing this story in the Islamic majority country, and it became a polarized story out of something which was not coming from the, the, the really from the, Euro, the, 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 the Danish Muslims. And in fact, if you have to assess the situation, the reaction of the European Muslims, it was quite reasonable. You don't have people just demonstrating. People were just saying sometimes it was plain racism and they were not accepting it. And some reacted through, you know, uh, suing some uh, magazines and trying to act as citizens. I was against this. I think it was not the right way to do this. But at the same time, the riots and all this, the, the, we didn't have this in, in, in Europe. It, it means, in fact, that it was outside Europe that this was used. And in Europe, the Muslims and mainly the, 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 the great majority of the European citizens were not reacting uh, passionately or out of emotions. And these are good signs that they are uh, understanding where they are living. They may don't like what was done and then not react emotionally and, and, and take, as I said, an intellectual critical distance. Uh, I have a couple more questions that, as you'll, as you'll see, relate to the way that the community, Muslim community in Europe uh, is uh, depicted uh, in our news headlines. Uh, one has to do with uh, the problem of Muslim anti-Semitism. Can you tell us about how severe you see the problem of Muslim anti-Semitism in Europe? Uh, you know, uh, it was a long time ago, in 92, 93. Uh, I had, I still have a friend uh, who is Jewish, his background is Jewish, and he told me, uh, coming from a Jewish background, and he told me once, Tarek, you have to do something about what is going on in the suburbs because there is a, a, a growing, you know, sense that anti-Semitism is around. I was feeling something, but I was not really involved in this, and, but I started listening after, after uh, uh, what he told me. And then I started, it was in 94, much before all what we are hearing on what we heard in France during the last year. And I, I wrote about it, I, 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 I recorded a, a, a tape on this saying, this is not acceptable, anti-Semitism. Uh, 
uh, is anti-Islamic. We cannot accept that. We can be critical. I am very critical towards the Israeli policy, but I don't uh, uh, confuse uh, criticizing a government with uh, being anti-Semit or accepting this. This is not acceptable. And then what we had, that true we had uh, people nurturing this their criticism uh, against the state of israel uh, and confusing this with an accepted you know uh, anti-semitic approach and we had to say i wrote this in le monde in 2001 afterward uh, saying this is not acceptable we cannot accept this we cannot accept this in europe we cannot accept it in in the states we cannot accept it uh, everywhere in the islamic uh, uh, majority countries now what we have also to say that are some intellectuals and some uh, uh, Jewish organizations uh, just every time you criticize the Israeli policy say this is anti-semitism we have something which is more dangerous and I was under you know the controversy that you had the reaction what you had in the States are also coming from what I was experiencing in France when I was saying to some French intellectuals Jewish and non-Jewish intellectuals, look, what you are doing is very dangerous because you are saying and telling us that the new anti-Semitism is coming from the Arabs and the Muslims. So you are playing one community against another in Europe or in France. And this is not acceptable. Let us, and this was the content of my article, let us come together as citizens of the same country and say any kind of racism, any kind of discriminations, anti-Semitism, anti uh, racism against Arabs, uh, black people, any kind of racism is not acceptable. There is no hierarchy uh, uh, among, uh, uh, you know, uh, racism, and we have to act against any kind of it. And this was the content, but some of our fellow citizens on that ground, they are using anti-Semitism as a tool, saying, when you start criticizing Israel, it means that you are implicitly anti semitic and I think it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I'm not anti-Semit when I'm criticizing the state of Israel. I'm not Islamophobic when I'm uh, criticizing the state of Saudi Arabia. This is something that we have to see clearly. And yes, it could be, and we had this problem, that within the Muslim communities, people were starting to uh, uh, nurture the sense of, you know, anti-Semit discourse we are saying no, and I think that if you go uh, 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 and visit now what is going on in, in Europe, I think that mainly uh, it's understood. It's not perfect. We still have to work a lot because we have to change mentality, but uh, we are working on it, and many Muslim organizations are aware of the problem. Uh, thank you. Sort of a related question. Um, many of the questions here uh, touch on the issue of the radicalization of Muslim youth in Europe, uh, the fact that Al-Qaeda bombers, uh, many of them, as you pointed out, had spent time studying and many had grown up in European context. So a specific question uh, in this regard, uh, in your well-developed understanding of the multiplicity of identity, at what point does radicalization take place? And what institutions need to be established to cut out the possibility of radicalization from occurring? Uh, look, it's a very complex issue. When we were in the task force uh, just after July the 7th, working on the profiles, on, on, on the people who were involved in, in the, 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 the terrorist attacks in London, there is something which is quite uh, uh, interesting in their profiles. And if you come to, to read and, and to compare the people who were involved in, in London, in Madrid, in, 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 in the States, in fact, they are not dealing with social marginalization or disintegration or not sufficient integration. Five features, mainly. The first one is that they were well educated. Second, not so long practicing Muslims, very recently or even, you know, uh, 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 for two weeks and, and uh, three weeks, few months. Second is that they were very westernized. So they were intellectually integrated culturally integrated, being part of the society at the same time in their society and uh, um, also uh, very intelligent, clever, not uh, uh, living on and, and having good jobs for many of them. So at one point there is something which is a kind of fracture uh, and here there is something which is they had all this dimension of integration, social integration, cultural integration, intellectual integration, but there is something which was missing. And you get this, and this is the common point, five features, and they were meeting in gyms, not in mosques, so they were not integrated in the Muslim community. 
So there is one feature which is the same everywhere, it's the psyche, it's us versus them. I'm going to kill you if you kill my people. So they were born and raised in Britain but without the sense of belonging. And when it comes to this, they have all this kind of integration, but one was missing, the psychological integration that you feel at home. And here, there is something which is a shared responsibility. The most, you know, when you have a, a kid who is going astray, you don't blame the father or the mother. Both are equally responsible. And these kids, these children, are the kids of the British society or the Western society and at the same time the Muslim community. So we have to be very strict on what should be done within the Muslim uh, communities as to a reform of Islamic education, the way we value the culture, the environment, the fact that we are in this society, that we are building bridges and that we are part of this society and we are not only, you know, under siege and protecting on the defensive and having a, a, an identity which is a self-segregated, constructed identity. On the other side, the society uh, should be more inclusive. What do we say, for example, in your curriculum in the States, but also here in Europe? How much are we inclusive in the way we value the presence of the Muslims? Now, you know, the parents, they came to build the country, they build America, they build Europe, and we still are talking about them to be integrated, and they have to integrate, saying nothing about their memories, not giving value to their past, saying our past is Greek and Christian and nothing else. I think that this is, is it's, it's really problematic. So more inclus uh, inclusiveness, at the same time, uh, uh, social justice, and not to confuse the social problems with the, as I said, the religious problems. All this is also, we need politicians knowing better their society and not using fears to build policies or security policies. And this is the problem. You know what you need? We need all together courageous politicians being able to challenge their citizens and to say don't be scared don't be afraid we can do something together and uh, to be more inclusive just to give this sense of belonging that we give value that we are not only asking the people to integrate but we value their contribution and not only uh, in you know a, a soccer's field as for example what I call the, the, the Zidane syndrome nobody is asking him where does he come from because he's giving something to the French team and I think that sometimes we are not seeing what the people are giving us and we keep on saying uh, you have to integrate without giving them other value. Thank you, Tark. We only have a couple of minutes before the satellite window closes, so I'd ask you to uh, respond to a, a question, our final question, which relates to the relevance of the Western Muslim experience for Muslim-majority countries around the world. In fact, two quick questions that I'll read, and again, we only have a minute or so. What can Western Muslim thinkers do to be taken seriously in Western majority societies? How do they avoid being marginalized as not really Muslim? And related to that, how are you perceived in the Arab world? Are you regarded as the westernized intellectual Muslim? Thank you. Yes, I, I, very quickly, I, I really think that what our experience in the West it will have and still have already have a tremendous impact you know everywhere i go in as i said in africa in north africa in the middle east in asia the people are listening to our experiences because we are able to remain muslims and at the same time to to address the new challenge it's not easy but we are heard and it comes for example about women for example about culture for example about technology for example about ethics for example all this is part of our contribution and I think that this, this dialogue is an ongoing dialogue and we need to understand that this is really, you know, recently I was in Turkey and all these ideas uh, about, you know, being a, a European Muslim, are, these are heard. So I really think that we, we need to take this into account. It's really important. But our fellow citizens should understand that if we are not able here to get this dialogue, it's all about suspicion. You know, many people are saying, oh, you are controversial and we don't trust you. They are so used to, to, to a very bad picture of Islam. And then I come to something which is possible, optimistic, say, oh, too beautiful to be true. And then you are controversial. We don't trust this double talk. You know, what we said to, about the Jews during the 30s and the 40s are coming back to us now as Muslims, uh, you know, gain of anti semitic trend still because at the end of the day we are all semite here there is something which is really to be addressed here is a question of trust it's a question of uh, being able to come together and us 
uh, uh, we need to be vocal, we need to come to the mainstream, to be heard, to be self-critical. Self-criticism and creativity are missing today and we need to build relationship with our fellow citizens with this trust and this critical you know, engagement and commitment. This is possible if we come together. So Muslims are responsible of this, but their fellow citizens should all be understand that they have to do something for, for in this field. As to me, in the Islamic majority country, it depends. I have lots of people who are following, uh, liking and following what I'm doing. And I have some traditionalists and uh, 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 literalists saying that I'm too much Westerners. But at the end of the day, I'm doing only one thing. I'm challenging them on, this, uh, on their field by coming with all my books are rooted in the Islamic tradition. And this is what I'm saying. If there is something wrong in my references, in the way I'm tackling this, come and challenge this. I don't have, you know, uh, 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 a clear answer, just accusation and rejection, but it's an ongoing process. I accepted this from the very beginning. I knew that being between two worlds, I will be criticized on both sides. But at the end of the day, patience and commitment and once again, transparency and consistency are the two main words that I'm trying to promote in my life. Thank you.